All right. Could you get started? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a little intro. Thank you. Just... All right, we might get started. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. So we've got Keegan Yaxley from over at ANU presenting today. So Keegan did his PhD over in Cambridge and, as I said, is now based at the ANU uh, in the Macro Eco Evo group. Um, so that's macroecology, macroevolution with um, Lyndall Brommen. And he mainly works on... I guess, macro evolution and using phylogenetics and comparative methods uh, to think about conservation planning and other things. He's also got a number of really cool projects on, I guess, non-biological systems. So the evolution of languages and things like that. Um, and yeah, really excited to hear about what he's been up to. Thanks, Keegan. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, thank you everyone for coming along today. I really appreciate it. Um, I finished my PhD during the um, COVID pandemic. So I was doing about two years of my PhD. We we're in lockdown and that meant I just got no opportunities to present. <laughs> so having this opportunity is really great. And so I really appreciate being invited here and really appreciate everyone who came along. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you about birds at distinction. Um, this is a broad title encapsulating a few projects that I'm involved in um, looking at the relationship between phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity in birds. Um, now the clicker isn't working, so I'm going to have to like run over and turn my back to you all periodically. And as like a recovering drama kid, that feels terrible because, you know, you should never turn your back to the audience. Um, um, but I want to start today with a few definitions. Um, apologies if anybody is already familiar with these concepts, um, but just for any of my talk to make sense, I have to make sure everyone in the room understands what phylogenetic diversity is and what functional diversity is. Um, so bro broadly, they're both measures of biodiversity. They measure particular facets of biodiversity. Um, phylogenetic diversity um, is a tree measure of um, biodiversity. Essentially what that means is it measures the amount of evolutionary history a group of taxa represent. Um, so it was originally proposed by Dan Faith in 1992, um, and he proposed a really simple phylogenetic diversity index, which we now just call Faith PD. And it's simply, you take a set of taxa, like here an emu, a zebra finch, and a superb fairy wren, you take their phylogeny and you count up the sum of the minimum number of branches that connect them on a phylogeny. So for this assemblage here, it would be five plus one plus three plus one plus one, which would give you a phylogenetic diversity of 11. Or we can have a more disparate group here um, where we have the emu, five, one, four, three, one, and that gives us a 14 because we're incorporating a longer branch length. Um, one critical thing to know about phylogenetic diversity is you never double count a branch. So you always count the minimum number of branches that connect species. So that means that as you add species, PD increases, but the rate of increase declines with species richness. Um, so that's phase PD. Really simple, intuitive to understand, easy to measure. For some reason, as of 2007, I haven't, there was a review done in 2007, I have actually counted since, but there's over 70 different ways to measure phylogenetic diversity in the literature now. Um, I'm not sure that's particularly helpful. <laughs> uh, some of them are really cool. I'll talk about a few of them later on in the talk, um, but a lot of them are fairly redundant and similar to one another. Um, and one of the other big advantages about PD is it's actually quite easy to measure. I mean, in these days with, you know, molecular, um, 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 molecular data just so readily available, people are able to build phylogenies fairly quickly and easily. Um, and the fact that we have near complete phylogenies for a number of like groups of taxa that we're particularly interested in conserving just means that really all you need to have is the tree and some knowledge about what species are living where and you can calculate phylogenetic diversity for them. Okay, so the other index I wanna talk about is um, functional diversity. So if phylogenetic diversity is a tree measure of diversity, functional diversity is a traity measure of diversity. And so what it attempts to do is measure the disparity of traits that are represented by a group of species. But crucially, it's only interested in the traits that somehow relate to the species' ecological role, like what it actually does in its environment, um, the niche it fills. It's not interested in sort of superfluous, um, superfluous traits. Um, as with PD, there's many, many ways to measure um, functional diversity, but what they typically involve is taking a bunch of measurements, whether that's you know, environmental categories or actual morphological measurements of different species, applying some sort of dimension reduction, 
or plotting those species out in morphospace and then finding some way to summarize either the distance between those species or the area in morphospace that they occupy. And that's how you get some sort of measure of functional diversity. Um, and it, not to cast shade on people who build phylogenies, I've built phylogenies, it takes a lot of work going out and collecting data to sequence takes a lot of work and then using phylogenetic software is an absolute nightmare. But building a phylogeny and getting the data to build a phylogeny is probably easier than it is, than is um, going out and actually measuring functional diversity, especially when you're talking about you know, big groups, when you're talking about across all mammals or all birds or all angiosperms. FD involves sending hundreds of researchers into the basements of museums to laboriously take out their calipers and measure animals or into the field to understand the ecology of um, different organisms. And so it's just a very labor intensive process. Um, and you can kind of see why functional diversity would be a really, really useful index for conservation biology. If you're protecting species based off the diversity of the actual ecological functions, the idea behind that is you'll be protecting ecosystem services. You'll be protecting um, the areas that contain the species that keep an ecosystem ticking over and healthy. So wouldn't it be awesome if we could use phylogenetic diversity to predict functional diversity, given that PD is fairly easy to measure, FD not easy to measure. Well, when Dan Faith originally suggested the concept of PD, he argued that it could be used as a proxy for feature diversity. I'm so sorry to bring in another term. <laughs> I won't mention feature diversity again, um, only that feature diversity is just a diversity of all the traits that an organism represents. So it's a much more abstract concept. It's not um, just the traits that reflect its ecological function. And the main reason I bring that up is because Dan Faith said feature diversity and everybody read functional diversity and went off testing whether it was a correlate of functional diversity. And Dan spent a lot of his career <laughs> um, rebutting people who have told him, uh, told him, who have told him that they're interested in his proxy for functional diversity and him having to say, well, I never said that it measured functional diversity. Um, okay. And so there's, but there is a the good theoretical grounding for why we would expect phylogenetic diversity to correlate with functional diversity. So if you have a group of species that are phylogenetically diverse, that means by definition, you have a group of species that are distantly related to one another. And that means they've had a lot of time, a lot of independent evolutionary time to adapt to novel environments, adapt to novel niches and um, evolve novel traits. But the idea behind that logic is, is if you have a group of taxon that are phylogenetically diverse, on average, you'll also have a group of taxon that are um, functionally diverse. Um, unfortunately, um, attempts to actually show that that relationship exists have proven equivocal. Um, so there's been many, many different studies that have tried to look at whether there's a relationship between functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity. Sometimes they do find a positive relationship. Um, often, though, they find no relationship, confusingly often a negative relationship between the two indices. And then to make things even confusing, sometimes st separate studies done on the same study systems will produce completely different results. <laughs> um, and if you're interested in this, um, the research more broadly, I'd really suggest um, going away and reading a review by my well, colleague and kind of supervisor, Marcel Cardillo, um, who has recently penned a sort of, I wouldn't describe it as a love letter, but a letter about PD. <laughs> um, cool, cool. So, oh, and I just wanted to give an example of like why that thinking that I explained bet between of why phylogenetic diversity should predict functional diversity kind of breaks down. So here I have three photos of birds. I took these photos and I took them all on O'Connor Ridge. So we know all of these birds live together. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Well, speckled warbler, you might not notice this guy, but crimson rosella and kookaburra, right? We've all seen them around Canberra. And we can just tell by looking at them that they're a sort of very disparate group of birds, right? We've got three very different kinds of birds. We've got a little puffball, We've got a pretty rosella that eats seeds and um, ruins my, drops stuff in my garden. And then we've got a giant kingfisher that occasionally eats lizards. And if we calculate the phylogenetic diversity of that group, we get a very phylogenetically diverse group. We get a group that has, represents 246 million years of evolutionary history. Really, really high PD. Then, and I'm cheating here because these birds don't live together, but then we have this other example. We have a New Zealand rock wren, a superb fairy wren, a Eurasian wren. All species of bird we call wren, 
because they're all essentially fluff balls with a little pointy beak. They eat the ground, they hop around, they're cute and fairly inconspicuous. But if we calculate the PD of that assemblage, we get 210 million years of evolutionary history. Um, so very functionally similar birds, slightly less phylogenetically diverse, but not hugely different. Um, and the reason why I've cheated in this example is that's because, you know, these three are all passerines, but the New Zealand rock wren and its sister species, the New Zealand rifleman, are considered the, uh, based on molecular evidence, we think that they're the sister clade to all other passeriforms. So this is like including this species in this group means you end up, when you're calculating phylogenetic diversity, you're, you're traversing all of passeriforms, and that's about 70 million years of evolutionary history. So basically, the point is, is that, yes, phylogenetic diversity might predict functional diversity, but because convergent evolution is rife across the tree of life, you often see that signal getting washed out. Okay, so why does the FDPD um, relationship hold in some contexts and not in others? Well, I've kind of hinted at one, which is taxonomic scale. There's been some work looking at this that has shown that well, actually, PD is a pretty good predictor of functional diversity when you're looking at closely related species. But as you go deeper into the tree, when you're getting into tens of millions of years of evolutionary history, convergent evolution starts washing out the signal that you, you, that, um, you would expect based off that thinking out, out, outlined before. Um, I'm not really going to talk about this much more today, um, but if you are interested in it, I really recommend this paper by Kelly and colleagues from 2014. It's a really interesting and clever simulation and meta-analysis where they looked at this. Okay, what I actually want to talk about is maybe the relationship between FD and PD is in some way mediated by environment and, and biogeography. So the environmental biogeographic history of the taxi you're actually looking at. Um, and there's good reasons why we might think that geography mediates this relationship because we know that both phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity show these geographical clients. I'm sorry, sorry, they vary along geographical gradients. So I just wanted to highlight two cool studies um, relating to this. So this is a study by Graham and colleagues from 2009, where they went and looked at, I think, 182 different assemblages of hummingbirds around Ecuador. Ecuador has like 40% of the world's hummingbird species in that tiny little Central American country. Um, and so what they did was they you know, went out, surveyed what hummingbirds were around in sites, and then they um, mapped that out and looked at what sort of geographical um, variation they could find in terms of both species richness and phylogenetic diversity. One really cool thing that they found that has nothing to do with PD um, is that they found that you, if you start at the base of a mountain in Ecuador and walk to the top of it, the composition of the hummingbird communities will turn over multiple times. That's just how diverse and how structured they are along altitudinal gradients. But something they found that I think was really interesting was that in the lowlands, in low-lying humid areas, they found that, so these kinds of areas here, they found that um, the hummingbird communities tended to be quite phylogenetically diverse. So you had lots of species from all over the tree coming and living together. But when you get into high altitudes, um, you tend to find very constant, phylogenetically concentrated assemblages of species. So lots of close relatives, lots of sister relatives sort of adapted to the same environment. Um, this is another example um, by one of my um, colleagues over at ANU, Alex Skills, um, where he uh, looked at functional diversity across a bunch of different lizard groups. So I've just highlighted two of them here. And basically what, he sh what they showed was that there was clear spatial structuring in how functional diversity was um, distributed across the planet. And that depended both on the group that you're looking at. So we've got geckos here compared to garments. You can see that the sort of hotspots are quite different. Um, and, it and, and that li likely reflected the sort of the biogeographic history of those groups. Cool. And then one last study, and this is the most important one for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, this is a study by Jazana et al. from 2021, where they mapped functional and phylogenetic diversity in birds in mountainous regions around the world. And what's really cool about this study is they didn't just map it, they looked at the relationship between the two um, indices, and they looked at whether there was an interaction with latitude. Um, and so what they basically found was, indeed, there was a strong interaction with latitude. Um, basically, at higher, so this is what this figure here is showing, so what you have here is the slopes between functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity across different latitudes. And you can see that as 
you go down in latitude, the slope becomes steeper and the intercept also changes. Um, so very cool result, suggesting that there is some way that latitude is mediating this relationship. Um, this paper had some limitations though. Um, their measurement of functional diversity was just based off body size and then three categorical traits that reflected ecology. Um, so, you know, there's not, not a lot of information being used there to discretize many thousands of different bird species. Um, and that's no fault of their own. Um, that was the data they had available to them. But if they had waited one year, <laughs> um, they would have been able to do what I did. <laughs> um, so I wanted to set out and sort of uh, re-examine uh, Jazina's approach, but see if it was generalizable outside of mountainous regions, whether you see latitude mediating the relationship between phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity across the planet. Um, and I was in a very lucky position to do this because I was sort of in the third year of my PhD and looking for a new chapter because COVID had ruined everything and I wasn't going to be able to go to any of the museums in Europe that I was planning on going to. Um, and we had all the available data we needed to do it. So we've had a near complete phylogeny of birds now for over 10 years, um, the Yetz et al phylogeny. This phylogeny has heaps of problems with it and it's basically impossible to publish anything with this phylogeny in it without at least one reviewer asking you to list all the problems that it has. Uh, um, however, apparently, it's been apparent for a while, but apparently we have a new bird phylogeny right around the corner, um, which is very, very exciting. Uh, and then, of course, thanks to, do we have any birders here today, by the way? Bird, and any of you use, like, any apps recording when the birds are? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thanks to your efforts, we have great distribution data for birds, for over 11,000 species, all collated by BirdLife International from various sources. And it basically means anywhere in the planet, we have a reasonably good guess at what birds are living there, which is awesome. And then most importantly for my study, this data set came out in 2022. Now it's the Avonet morphometric data set of birds. Um, I'm gonna briefly sort of introduce everyone to Avonet because I think it's an incredible resource and I think it deserves spruiking. So yes, Avonet is a morphological data set that includes more than 11,000 different species of birds. And it's based off um, measurements taken from more than 90,000 different individuals, usually museum specimens. And what's incredible is that they actually have set out to measure 11 morphological features. Um, so nine of them are here, and then the other two are the body size so in, measured in grams of the bird, and then also the hand to weed index. Um, and then on top of that, they included a couple of ecological variables, the range size of these species of birds. And then amazingly, like most amazingly, they presented it in multiple taxonomic formats. So if you needed to use the Yetz tree, you could line it up with the Yetz tree. If you needed to use BirdLife International, you could line it up with BirdLife International. And they made like bringing those different data sources together um, very straightforward. Um, and it also had more authors that I could, than I could be bothered counting to tell you. But so I just thought I'd just screen cap it and put like the full author list. So like I said, functional diversity takes thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours of labor to get it to the point of something like Avonet. But yes, incredible database that I wanted to use. Oh, and the sword build hummingbird is their mascot for obvious reasons. Um, cool. So wanted to go, wanted to set out and map how PD and FD in birds are distributed across the planet and how the relationship between those two measures varies with one another. So what we did was we divided the world into one degree by one degree grid cells, which gives you approximately 17,000 different bird assemblages, each one of these little grids here. Um, and then we calculated face phylogenetic diversity based off the birds found in that grid cells and mean pairwise functional distance, which is one measure of functional diversity um, for each of those assemblages. Um, unfortunately, you can't just use raw face phylogenetic diversity because it's heavily influenced by species richness. As I said before, the more species that you have in an assemblage, the more phylogenetically diverse it's going to be just because you're sampling more of the tree. And there are a bunch of ways to get around that. But one uh, way we decided to use was to, stand, uh, to get standardized effect sizes. So that means you somehow permute your assemblage your bird assemblages, and then you compare the values you get when they're permuted um, to your empirical values, and you use that to calculate the standardized effect size. Um, the simplest way to do this is just called a tip shuffle, where you just say, oh, okay, so this is the birds around Canberra. Well, there's 70 or so bird species. We'll sample 70 bird species from anywhere on the planet and say that they live here. Um, 
that's not a great null hypothesis for our purposes because it's very, very easy to, um, uh, to it's very, so it's very hard for that null to produce any results that look like the real world because the distribution of birds is of course shaped by both their in, um, evolutionary history and also their environmental history. So we decided to go with a more conservative null, which we called the regional null. And so basically what we did was we took Dinerstein et al's um, biomes and then biomes within each region, a region being like South America, North America. And so then we only permuted bird species within the, that, like within a given region. So this cell here, for example, could only be randomly generated from birds that were found within the same bio. Um, cool, that's what we did. And then our first result was, of course, just mapping these two things out and seeing where it's interesting. So the cool thing about standardized effect sizes is they, they tell you how much your empirical data deviates from your expectation given the null. And so that's what this map here is showing. It's showing where, well, the top one's showing functional diversity. So it's showing where functional diversity is higher than we expected given our null. And, it's, or, and then also the purple is showing where it's lower than expected. And what we quickly found was that most of the world is less functionally diverse than we expect given, given our null, which is interesting. But we did find a few regions of exceptional functional diversity. And they included, it's quite hard to see at the moment, but the Northern Andes, you're just gonna have to take my word for it, that they, they were absolutely popping. Um, and then also the Hengduan mountain range in Southern China, both these regions of exceptional functional diversity. And then also much more confusingly, we found higher than expected functional diversity sort of along the southern border of Russia and the southern border of Canada. So in the, the Tiger region. Um, quite hard to explain because like the Andes and the Hengduan Mountains are both recently uplifted tropical mountains. You know, they're really steep. There's waterfalls everywhere. There's just a lot of environmental heterogeneity. There's a lot of ways for animals to eke out a living there. So it makes sense that we would see quite a lot of functional diversity in the species that are living there. Yeah, and Canada's kind of, they're all sort of kind of, I mean, it's like a beautiful place, but it's not nearly as um, um, heterogeneous as these tropical mountains. So we're a little bit surprised by that result. Um, we think basically what was happening here was it's kind of an artifact of our null model. So when you're in far high latitudes, you have there's very, very restricted resources and there's probably only space for one bird species to really monopolize any one given um, resource or one given strategy, right? And so what that means is say you have like a ground nesting bird in a grid cell to, in Siberia and then you, uh, among a bunch of other species, and then you randomly sample across that, um, across this region, it's likely that you might sample two ground nesting bird species that are found in the, or sort of two um, functionally similar species just that are distributed across this really, really large biome. Um, and that's going to instantly reduce the, the functional diversity com compared to the empirical data. Um, so like interesting, but yeah, maybe possibly just an artifact of how we, we modeled um, our null. Um, and then regions of exceptionally high phylogenetic diversity, they made perfect sense. So it was the tropics where you have, you know, the, the tropical refugia, you have, you know, multiple, after multiple um, glaciations, you have species coming back into the tropics, encouraging phylogenetic diversity. And then we also saw really high phylogenetic diversity in the kind of biogeographic convergence zones that you'd expect. So areas like Wallacea, where you have two different biotas coming together and exchanging species. But mapping it was one thing. What we really wanted to know was what was the relationship between these two, um, these two variables. So of course, the first thing you do is you just plot it out and you see. And overall, we actually found a negative relationship. So what that means is regions that had higher than expected phylogenetic diversity had lower than expected functional diversity given our null model. Um, of course, this is probably not the best way to do it because there's a lot of confounding variables that we have to take into account. And we also wanted to see how that relationship varied with latitude. So that's why we employed um, like a spatially explicit structural equation modeling approach to test this. I'm not gonna bore you all by explaining how I set up these models because it's very dull stuff. Um, but basically they included, crucially they included an interaction term. So the, we modeled the functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity relationship with functional diversity as the outcome variable. And then we also included an interaction with latitude. And what that basically means is it shows you how the slope between FD and PD changes for different 
values of latitude. And I should say latitude was treated as an absolute value. So really we're talking about distance from the equator. Um, and so I'll get you to focus on this blue line. So what we found was that there was a weak negative relationship between these two indices at the, in the tropics. And then as we moved away, that relationship became progressively more and more steeply negative. Um, we had to think about this and we thought that one thing that might be contributing to it was um, the fact that also the further you get away from um, the, the equator, um, you also have a higher proportion of migratory species um, uh, making up the, the, the bulk of the um, community assemblages. And so we thought, well, migratory species are probably under quite strict constraints. And so it might be that we're, what we're actually seeing is a bias to sort of functionally constrained um, species at higher clines, making up a larger and larger component. Um, so we wrote this up. We presented that as a possible explanation in the discussion, even did like this little plot to be like, yeah, look, migratory species in increase. And the viewer was like, you can't just say it, you should test it. Like the data's out there. So we tested it. <laughs> so I redid it. I included in the model a term that was just the proportion of um, species that were identified as migratory in any one of these assemblages. And what we found was, yep, sure enough, it actually, we still got this steep interaction term, but it massively shifted the intercept. And that meant that well, now we actually have a positive relationship in the tropics, but for most of the distribution, most of the temperate region, we have a, a basically no relationship. Um, that was really interesting. Okay, cool. So that's the first study. Um, now I wanna move on to what we did next. So, um, and I'm gonna introduce another conservation index. I'm gonna talk about weighted endemism. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with weighted endemism, it's so simple. Um, it's just a measure that tries to value species based off how widely distributed they are. Um, and the way you do that is you take the um, global range size of a species and you take, take its reciprocal. So one over the range size, and that gives you weighted endemism. Um, so I just have some examples here. So we have probably the least endemic species of bird on the planet, um, the peregrine falcon, which is found absolutely everywhere. And it has a weighted endemism score of, well, it's a very small number. Um, Compare that to a crimson rosella around Canberra, much, much larger weighted endemism score because it's really restricted to the southeast of Australia. And then you have the green rosella. Anyone who's spent any time in forests in Tassie might have seen this guy. They're a lot, um, they're a lot more afraid of humans than crimson rosellas are around here, but they're really cute. Um, and it has, you know, quite a high weighted endemism score. So that's how you calculate weighted endemism. But of course, it has a phylogenetic equivalent. Because why wouldn't it? So phylogenetic endemism, basically, you're doing the same thing. You're taking the reciprocal of um, a species' geographical range. But rather than just weighting one, so just the presence of the species, you're weighting the branch lengths of your tree. And so it's pretty straightforward to calculate. So what you do is, so for your tips, it's really just the branch, um, um, sorry, it's just, the, yes, uh, the branch length divided by the range size of the species. And then when you have a branch that has multiple tips descending from it, what you do is you calculate the intersection of their ranges. So you don't, so in this example here, we've got the zebra finch and the superb fairy wren. And so we have a, a range size for the superb fairy wren of four kilometers and a range size for the zebra finch of two kilometers. Because all of the zebra finches range falls within that of the fairy wren, it only, this branch is only divided by four. So it's the, in, the area of the intersection between those ranges. And, and that's also true here where we have the cockatoo and our fairy wren and zebra finch. We're not counting this, this little intersection of one square kilometre twice. Um, this, uh, and, and so then once you've weighted all of these branch lengths, you just calculate phylogenetic endemism the same way you calculate PD. You say what species are where, and you count up these, you sum up these weighted branches. Um, this was uh, first developed by Dan Rosser, who used to be at the ANU. It's not anymore, unfortunately. Um, and when he published it, he did a really cool paper where, hey, not birds, um, he mapped phylogenetic diversity of terrestrial mammals around the world and identified some cool hotspots. Um, so the areas like the Caribbean, we have the Selenodons, um, Madagascar, unsurprisingly, a lot of um, phylogenetically endemic species on Madagascar. And then also in Australia, things like the Gordian mouse. Gould's mouse, sorry. Cool. So phylogenetic endemism exists. 
But me and my colleague Alex got thinking, well, would it be possible to create a measure of functional endemism? And I know I was already critical about people just inventing new indices for the sake of it at the introduction, but we thought once you know that you can do it, it's like, why not? <laughs> it's pretty hard to stop yourself. <laughs> and so we got thinking about this and we realized, well, really, we don't even need to invent a new index. We can just use phylogenetic endemism, the way it's calculated, but rather than using a tree that represents evolutionary history, we just need a tree that rep represents morphological distance. And so the way we did this was we took all of our species of birds, we plotted them in morphospace, and then we just got Euclidean distances between all possible pairs of species. And then we just fed that to a tree building algorithm. So think, yeah, I think in the end we chose a pugma tree, but you know, we tested neighborhood joining trees, we tested a bunch of different tree algorithms to end up with a functional dendrogram. And then once you have that, we could go away. So this is it. This is a functional dendrogram of the 8,074 species we could use based on 11 of the traits in Avonet. And then we calculated functional endemism and phylogenetic endemism all around the planet. Um, so this was published last year, I think. Um, and then, of course, because we couldn't help ourselves, we had to see whether they were related to one another. So we plotted them against each other. In this case, we get a nice positive relationship between the two indices, but that makes sense because both of them are getting the same range sizes thrown in to each point, right? Um, but what was really interesting is, so you see this nice tight clustering, and then you see these crazy points up here that just have far more functional endemism than you'd expect given their phylogenetic endemism. Something, so either they're really, really re range restricted or they're really functionally unique. So of course we when tried to find where on the planet these points were, and sure enough, they all came out on these sort of large islands where we know we get freaky dicky birds. So Tasmania came out, we have things like Tasmania native hen, New Caledonia, where you have the Kagu, which absolutely looks like a Pokemon. I don't think anyone could dispute that. Um, the Galapagos, don't need to tell you that. Galapagos finches are famous for being functionally distinct from one another. Um, and then, of course, like the king of all freaky dicky bird assemblages, New Zealand. New Zealand, half these points were basically found in New Zealand. And that, you know, that makes perfect sense. The New Zealand birds are absolutely incredible. Um, you know, on other islands, we have sort of birds fulfilling, you know, the niches of birds that might be fulfilled by a bird from a different clade. But in New Zealand, you have birds doing things that really a mammal should be doing. Um, they're just getting away with it, <laughs> the lack of competition. Um, uh, cool. So now I want to, how am I going for time? Sorry, I don't actually have a clock. Pretty good. Oh, easy. Okay, so now I want to turn and focus to, it's really cool to see, to map these two indices out, to see if they have a relationship, to see how environment affects it. But fundamentally, these two indices were proposed as means of helping conservation biology. Um, phylogenetic diversity itself gets talked a lot in academic circles. There's a lot of literature and research um, on it. But in terms of actual uptake by conservation programs, that's pretty limited. Um, one measure, though, that's related to functional diversity that has been really, really um, widely accepted is evolutionary distinctiveness. So all the indices I've talked about so far are about groups of species. They're about finding an assemblage and asking how valuable is this group of species. What evolutionary distinctiveness does instead is it asks how valuable are individual species. And so what it basically is trying to do is it's trying to identify species like the Chuatara, these sort of living fossil species, that on their own represent a huge proportion of evolutionary history. And it's done really simply. Um, basically, again, you take a phylogeny, and what you do is you weight each of the branch lengths by the number of tips that descend from that branch. So in this case, you know, we have 3 million years along this branch with our zebra finch and our fairy wren descending from it. So 3 divided by 2. And then you just take the sum of all of the branches that connect each species to the root of the tree to get ED scores. Um, so this is originally proposed by Isaac and colleagues at the ZSL, um, and what they did was they developed this index called um, EDGE. So what EDGE does is it takes evolutionary distinctiveness scores and it combines them by IUCN endangerment rankings, and you get the EDGE score. Of course, it's already been extended to functional distinctiveness as well. Um, so the functional distinctiveness is calculated exactly the same, you build a functional tree, you weight those branches, you take the sums, and that gives you FUD or ECOD, 
Um, and then once you combine that with global endangerment, you get, I'm really disappointed that they went with a codge because fudge was like right there. Yeah. <laughs> like at any moment they could have said fudge. Maybe they wanted to be taken seriously as researchers. <laughs> um, and all of this came to my attention. I just wanted to shout out this really, really cool um, paper done by a researcher over in the UK, Phoebe Griffith, where she looked at how um, compared edge to a codge in um, um, crocodilians and asked, well, what, how effective are these two measures at preserving um, evolutionary history and functional diversity? What she didn't do is she didn't ask the cross, how effective is edge at predicting functional diversity and how effective is um, eco a codge at predicting phylogenetic diversity? Um, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting the clicker doesn't work. Um, and edge is a really important index because edge actually money is actually given to researchers based on the edge scores of the species they're interested in. So I just wanted to briefly explain how edge works. So what the edge society does is they will take a, phylo a big phylogeny, they'll calculate edge scores for all those species, and then they make lists of the 100 top species, or the 100 top species based on their evolutionary distinctiveness and their endangerment ranking. And then if you are doing research in a developing country and you're from a developing country, you can apply to the DSL to do a conservation project on an edge species, and there's a lot of money there. Um, to help you do that. Really, really cool program. I just wanted to highlight some um, cool edge species. So we have the numbat, the Philippine eagle, Chinese giant salamander. These have all been identified as priorities by the, the edge program. Cool. No one's giving out money on a codge yet, just to be clear. Um, okay, so first thing I wanted to kind of establish before I went and tested the efficacy of these two different measures, was I wanted to just look at, well, how imperiled in birds is phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity? So what I did was I just ran a really simple simulation where you assign every species a probability of going extinct based off its IUCN, IUCN ranking. Then you roll the dice, see who goes extinct, and you calculate well, how much phylogenetic diversity was lost compared to how much functional diversity. And so this, these box plots on the left show the loss of functional diversity, while the ones on the right show the loss of phylogenetic diversity. And this is under two scenarios, one where which is optimistic and one which is pessimistic. And basically that just depends, you know, the, the pessimistic one, there's a higher chance of critically endangered and endangered species actually going extinct. And what we really, you can really, really clearly see is that functional diversity is at, is at much greater risk based off current IUCN endangerment rankings and phylogenetic diversity. Phylogenetic diversity was pretty robust. Functional diversity, we could lose a lot of it if we do nothing. But of course, we're not going to do nothing. Um, so the next thing I did was I calculated a codge and edge scores for all of the birds in our data space. Um, and then I compared priority lists. I compared priority lists for evolutionary distinctiveness, for functional distinctiveness, and then also the edge and the codge scores. And what I found was that there was very little agreement between um, ED and FD. Really only 14 species appeared in both lists. But once you um, started comparing edge to a codge, you got almost 50% agreement in the priority species that were included in that list. Naturally, that 50-50 in a list of 100 may be incredibly suspicious. Like, <laughs> I'm sure we've all had that when you get like a nice whole number in analysis, and you're like, oh, well, it must be, I must have made an error somewhere. But I went and checked, everything seems fine. Um, and these plots here just show you the distribution of um, all of the, um, all of the species across their global endangerment and their ED or their functional distinctiveness. And then the color behind it just shows the expected edge or a codge value you'd get in that region. Um, and what this really shows and the overlap of 50-50 is that like being endangered as it's designed really matters to whether you're gonna be included in these lists. It doesn't really matter how evolutionarily distinct you are. If you're not under any threat, you're not gonna make it. Um, and I just wanted to highlight these two birds. So this was my top edge bird, the giant ibis, um, and this was my top a codge bird, the helmeted hornbill. No surprises, he's critically endangered. He's also super freaky, but we love him nonetheless. <laughs> um, cool. All right, but how actually effective are they? So I wanted to test, like, if you're, if you're actually intervening to save species based on a codge or based on edge, how much phylogenetic diversity you're saving and how much functional diversity you're saving. 
So to do that, I just that um, simulation of extinctions I spoke about before, we just repeat that, but we intervene this time. We choose some n number of species that we're going to save. We're going to stop them from going extinct. Um, n changes between simulations from anything from 8,000 to species. So we save everything to something as low as two. And we just run that again and again. And the order that we save species is determined by four different treatments. We either work down our edge list, we work down our codge list, we just protect things based off their endangerment ranking, or we just protect things completely randomly. And so what I found was that a codge actually, unsurprisingly, is better at... So let me explain this graph, actually. So, so the blue line shows you this is the percentage loss, the amount of functional diversity you would lose, or phylogenetic diversity. And the blue line here is the um, eco-edge treatment, so our functional diversity treatment, and the orange line is the edge treatment. And what you can see is that the blue line is far outperforming um, the edge treatment. So when we target our conservation efforts based on functional diversity, we preserve more functional diversity than if we just targeted on phylogenetic diversity. That's not super surprising, right? What is surprising, I think, is that when we we also basically save as much phylogenetic diversity. Really, there's not a lot to be gained from focusing on phylogenetic diversity over focusing on functional diversity. But I'm sure some of you have already spotted a potential problem here. When you actually zoom in in the area that matters, this top 100, the gains that you get from using either a codge or using the edge measure are marginally better than just protecting species because they're critically endangered. Like you basically get as many gains in terms of savings, phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity if we just keep doing what we're doing, which is identifying species that are at risk and trying to stop them from going extinct. Um, so this is, a, this is stuff that hasn't been published yet. I'm still sort of working on it. Um, um, but so basically my conclusions for today are that PD and FD are in fact different things. We might expect them to correlate. They do correlate under some circumstances, but there's a lot of other factors at play washing out that signal. Um, but if we want to actually use these, if we want to make the meaningful tools um, that we want conservation planners to uptake, we need to make sure that they're actually doing something better than the current status quo. Um, and then future directions, obviously, this would be easy to apply to other clades when we've, uh, there are a few other groups that have large functional databases, none as good as AFNET in terms of species coverage, but some that are really good. Happy to talk about those with anyone after the talk if they're interested. And then because I'm a macroevolutionary biologist, at some point for the sake of my supervisor's grant, I need to think about how I can connect this work to macroevolution. Um, any questions? Thanks, Keegan. That was awesome. Oh, thanks. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Um, yeah, so you mentioned that sometimes the relationship's there and sometimes it's not between PD and FD. Um, and it strikes me maybe that that's not so surprising in the sense that you can think of different mechanisms that would lead to different relationships. So, you know, divergent evolution as a result of competition mm -hmm. versus constraints due to environmental factors that constrain things to be a certain thing. And then, you know, looking at what you do, I can also think you've got heaps of what you might call kind of researcher degrees of freedom and how you went about this. You What traits you choose as your functional traits. You used a, you know, one degree grid cell, but, you know, you could use a half degree grid cell and so on and so on. So I'm just wondering, you know, if, if in, in a sense, some of the, you know, mixed results that are coming out reflects both the fact that there are potentially multiple mechanisms influence that relationship in biology mm -hmm. and then also the fact that researchers you know have all these kind of choices about how they go out studying and measuring these things is oh, yeah you're, you're absolutely right i mean to address like i mean the traits that people choose to measure is going to have a huge impact um one of the nice things about avonet was they did try to focus on traits that had been shown um to vary significantly with the ecology of birds so things that the things like the shape of the beak things that are going to determine how a bird actually interacts with its environment um it's really interesting that you brought up the scale of the grid cells because there has been work done that shows that the slope it changes between these two variables depending on the how the resolution the the geographic re resolution that you're looking at 
Um, so yes, there is there. That's the thing. There's all of these different ways that a researcher can intervene and change the potential relationship. Um, but the reality is, if is if phylogenetic diversity is going to be this killer app as a proxy for functional diversity, we even need to find ways to be consistent about it, or or find the resolutions at which it works. Yeah, yeah. I have a question building on that. Um, I guess I can definitely see why the scale that you looked at is important or interesting kind of in a broad sense and to have a look at those patterns across the globe. But do you think sometimes with these um, conservation planning studies that do look at that scale, they kind of lose their informativeness? Like, can you get more informative uh, more information from kind of yeah, going at that smaller scale and can that be more... I guess used for planning rather than understanding big patterns. I, I think I think so. I mean, like, how many more times do we need to declare that this that the Indonesia has biodiversity hotspots in it? Right? <laughs> like, um, no. I think you're right. I think at potentially at sort of you know like the landscape ecology um, level, these indices, the way you would deploy these indices could be completely different. Right? You might actually find, oh well, you know, we this. Um, particular region in a range is a seed for functional diversity and we have functionally diverse species that go and use it for breeding or there's some sort of limiting resource or something like that that means that they're visiting these areas and that would be a really interesting way to deploy some of those indices. So yeah, absolutely agree that like, you know, um, I think a lot of the time these sort of big hotspot style studies get a lot of traction, but maybe they're not necessarily the most practical, useful things for actually um, informing conservation planning day to day. And do you think maybe they break down at the smaller scale too? Like, could you, are there limit, uh, I guess, maximum and minimum limits where if you go too small, you know, you can't provide that information to someone who's um, responsible for an entire tenure or something, because if you're just looking within an area that's too small, it's not actually informative? Yeah, well, presumably, right, if, if, if like the more heterogeneous the landscape is, the smaller you get, the more likely you are to, well, maybe the more likely you are to actually sample it properly, but the larger you get, the more likely, you know, uh, heterogeneous or a homogeneous area is going to swamp the area that's actually of interest and of, of um, value. Yeah, cool, thanks. Hi, <laughs> thanks for that. It's really interesting. Um, so you've used basically a, the, the data for bird species that's currently existing. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly for something like the last couple of graphs where you plotted percentage lost. Uh, can you plot uh, species which we know have gone extinct and for which you have the data, whether uh, they fit into the picture? So I would love to do that. And you, presumably you could do it for functional diversity, right? If if we have enough museum specimens of recent extinctions that you can get this kind of data. Doing it for phylogenetic diversity, of course, is going to be a lot trickier. Um, I don't think there's a good, no, no attempt to build like a combined evidence phylogeny that incorporates recently extinct species of birds onto the tree that I know of. Um, but it'll be really interesting, right? Because you could be seeing all of this through an in extinction filter, right? We might be absolutely yeah. missing the aspects of morphology that are, that, um, are really at risk because most of them are already gone. Yeah. Yeah. I'd encourage you to try. You encourage me to try? Oh, I'd love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, if there's no more questions, I might leave it at that. And um, we're going to head out for lunch after. So if anyone wants to join, please come along and join me in thanking Keegan again. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no. Massively under or massively over? No, it's okay. Time to head to the end of the day. Yeah, there's a few times that it's like, I'm still doing this. Okay, good job. Also, I realized when you asked how you're doing, I just gave you the actual phone, which is not that useful. I'm counting the blue and 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 the Less tend to something going wrong. Oh, so, yeah. Right? Yeah. That one was mine. Thank you. Um, I think you did a great job of explaining all the concepts. I thought it was really cool. Very exciting. Oh, I see.
I know why it wasn't working. Because the USB wasn't plugged in. That's fine. It definitely gave me a minute to reply. 